Across the United States, summer is a season many of us look forward to. As with any season, people have their own nostalgic traditions to carry out this time of year. But of course, it isn't all fun. Just as the gloom of winter can get old pretty fast, so can the heat of summer. Even if you love summer, you may wish you could skip over the true peak of this season, the hottest time of year. Which is, well, when is that exactly? When is the hottest time of year? The answer to that question actually varies widely across the contiguous United States, depending on where you live. It could range from early June all the way to late September, depending on your location. Across the country, there are massive regional variations in how we experience the heat of summer and when. This variability may seem perplexing, but there are explanations for the patterns we see on this map of the contiguous U.S. Those patterns are what we'll be exploring today. Our summer solstice, when the sun is most directly overhead and the days are longest, is around June 21st. But because it takes time for the ocean and atmosphere to heat up, the hottest time of year is more often in July, just as the coldest time of year tends to be in January well after the winter solstice around December 21st. But there is a drastic exception in the heart of the Southwest, from West Texas to Southern Arizona. Here, the hottest time of year is in June. I want to start by explaining this hot June zone because it's actually linked to the unusually hot August weather in surrounding regions. This area of the Southwest, where the heat of summer strikes early, covers part of the Sonoran Desert and the Chihuahuan Desert, our two major hot deserts in North America. Throughout this region, June is a very dry month, but in late summer, there is a sudden increase in rainfall. That rainfall is brought by the Southwest Monsoon, also known as the Mexican Monsoon or North American Monsoon. As the interior of the continent heats up in summer, the low pressure draws in tropical moisture from the south. This moisture comes from three places primarily, the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of California, and a triangle of warm water in the Pacific. Just as in other subtropical deserts around the world, the summer monsoon will not get near the cool waters off the western shores of the continent. That's because a strong, high pressure system persists offshore and because cool surface water, provided by cold currents and upwelling, cools air at the surface and thus inhibits vertical convection in the atmosphere. In short, coastal California misses out on the booming thunderstorms of the interior desert. This late summer monsoon brings increased cloud cover and increased relative humidity. With more water in the air and soil, it's more difficult for daytime temperatures to rise quite as high as they do in June. That's a blessing for the ecosystem here. As monsoon rain trickles through the pine needles of the mountains and splashes cacti on the desert plains, it brings life to the southwest. You'll see a similar phenomenon in other parts of the world with a monsoon season. In Lahore, Pakistan, May and June see much higher temperatures than July or August. It's that time of year when summer has arrived but the monsoon hasn't. And the late summer monsoon in the American Southwest has wide-reaching impacts on surrounding regions. That brings me to this part of the South Central United States, where the hottest day of the year is typically in August. A more specific region, between the Arkansas River and the Rio Grande, is particularly prone to hot August weather. This is a fascinating and often misunderstood part of the country. Most outsiders will accurately imagine the western edge of this region in central Texas, wide open plains dotted with prickly pear cactus. But overall, this part of the country is far more green than some of us in the east might imagine. The city of Texarkana, Texas, for instance, gets more rainfall than I do in Raleigh, North Carolina. Precipitation in our country does not gradually decrease as you travel west. 
In the south, it drops off sharply between 95 and 100 degrees longitude. Eastern Texas and eastern Oklahoma have substantial forests, contrary to what many of us in the east might imagine. That's why, ecologically, this region is often grouped in with the rest of the southeast. But there is a critical difference between this region and the areas farther east, and that is a noticeable late summer dry season, an August or July-August dry season. After the torrential rains of May and June, this area sees rainfall decrease and temperatures spike in late summer. That drop in rainfall in late summer is actually caused by the monsoon farther west. As air rises over the southwest, producing rain there, it sinks over adjacent regions, including the area to the north, in Montana for instance, and to the east. That sinking air inhibits air at the surface from rising, which reduces cloud cover and rainfall. This sinking air, or high pressure, also increases temperatures. Over continents in summer, high pressure can lead to scorching temperatures. That's because air heated at the surface is prevented from rising and distributing the heat more evenly throughout the atmosphere. The heat is trapped at the surface. The effects of this hot, dry season on the ecology and history of the region have been profound. Despite the reasonable rainfall, natural selection has favored the highly drought tolerant. Shortleaf pine covers the sandstone ridges of the Wachita Mountains in Oklahoma, and blackjack oak thrives throughout the region. Historically, steamboats had to plan their trips around this season as river levels plummeted in July and remained low through autumn. When you factor in humidity to consider the overall heat index, this part of the south central United States clearly stands out. Thanks to its continental location and humidity from the Gulf of Mexico, summers in this region come with a very high risk of heat stroke. Only the lowest elevations of the Sonoran Desert, near the Gulf of California, can compete with the heat index of this region in summer. Another noticeable feature of this map is the west coast, where the hottest day tends to be very late in the year, in August or September. If we're talking about the warmest month overall, that can come even later, as late as October in some places. Why is summer so late here? Well, I've mentioned this in my video on San Francisco, and the two factors behind this are quite simple. For one, the upwelling of cold, deep water along the coast is strongest in spring and early summer, and it weakens in late summer. That means the chilly marine layer over top of that cold water weakens along with it. The interior of the continent also begins to cool off this time of year, while the Pacific remains relatively warm. The cooler, denser air in the interior flows toward the less dense, warmer air over the Pacific. As it crosses mountain ranges, it becomes very dry and is warmed by the Foehn effect. These hot, dry winds are referred to as Santa Ana winds in Southern California, while in Northern California, they're called Diablo winds. These winds bring hot and dry conditions with a high risk of wildfire. There are many more regional variations throughout the country, but I hope this video has illustrated how diverse the summer season is across the United States. As always, the sources for this video are in the description. Thanks for watching. If you find these topics interesting, consider subscribing. There will be many more to come.